when we look at the Mass, um, I think one of the difficulties we as Catholics have is that it's something we do all the time. It's something that we sometimes can take for granted or we can just do out of rote memorization. When I was in my last assignment, um, I lived up in corridor, and I would go into Atlanta a lot for meetings and different things, and I could get up 85 without really even thinking about it. And I got home, and I'm like, well, I don't remember the trip. Because you just do it over and over and over and over again. For those who used to commute, that might know home now, but it could become this situation where we just kind of do this out of habit. Like most of us don't up brushing our teeth, right? We just... We don't sit there and go, okay, brush number one, not number two. You just brush your teeth. Sometimes masks can get like that, especially for those of us who have been going to mass all the time in our lives, and it just becomes a rote action. It's something we just simply do. And we can miss out on beauty that is within the mass experience that sometimes can get away from us because it just becomes a habitual act. Um, Sadly, most Catholics ask, why do we stand, why do we kneel here, why do we, uh, why do we sit down in these Most of us would say, I don't know. Uh, it's what we do. We're Catholics, so we stand at this part, we sit at this part, and we kneel at this part. And most people would say, but he would go, I don't know. And so it becomes that choice. Things can be the, the meaning behind what we do can be lost. There's a great book out, and this I'm going to read over the next three sections. It's called uh, The Jewish of the Eucharist. So if you want a good book, it's on Audible or on um, that one. Jewish Roots of the Eucharist. Okay. So Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, and it, the uh, person who wrote it, his last name is Peachtree, P-I-T-R-E. Not Peach Tree, but P-I-T-R-E. He's a professor, he's not a longer a professor, very uh, but he is still a doctor, and he's a I don't like very fan of that, but anyway. He's, he writes the beauty of the Old Testament connection. Okay. Because uh, we don't understand where it come from because the people that this experience that was living with, who it also was, was Jewish. There's no way to get around that. Jewish was very much a part of what we do, what we do today. So if you look at the Mass, um, we have to understand what happened at the first. We have to understand what the the Last Supper was about, the Passover meal. So those of you who have been to the, to the um, uh, Seder meal, something similar, but full experience, right? So what happened, what the Passover was all about, was about a remember, remembrance of what they experienced in Egypt, right? So there's this experience of saying, Hey, we, we want to. Re Jesus said, "I wanted you to perpetually celebrate this experience because it was that powerful in the life." And so, does everyone? Know? I'll go over a little Passover experience. So, what happened in the in the Jews was that they kept having these plagues that God brought upon the people. Pharaoh kept, "Oh, I'm not least of the Jews." He finally said, "Okay," and then they they start heading out. And then Pharaoh kind of regresses this decision and goes after them. We have the experience of the parting of the Red Sea. You know, Moses stands up and says, here, I'm parting the Red Sea. Then he comes back on the Egyptians, but they choose to escape. Right? The first Egypt in the desert was what? Complaint. They grumbled, right? The first thing they do is they grumbled, right? Oy vey! He brings us out into the desert and he's going to let us starve. And so Moses goes, all right, my people are complaining. This, we're, we're complainers from the very beginning. And they, Jesus, God provides for them daily, right? He provides for them what? Manna from heaven? 
also something right by to uh, sustenance of food that they had to retrieve each day right right they had to provide it on Saturday they had to get it well not on Sunday but Sabbath was Saturday for them right so they, had to, they every day of the week they had to get just enough for the day except for the Sabbath which they got double the day before um, then they were able to say that they had enough for the Sabbath because the Sabbath was a day of of rest just like it is now right Sunday's the day of rest. chickens right so God provided for them daily it's a word that we use all the time in the what prayer and the our father please provide our daily bread right so there's this experience of the understanding of what happened in the Old Testament that prefigured and is attached to what we celebrate. The experience of understanding what the Passover was about. So what did they have to do in order to get out? Right? So they had to celebrate this experience, one of the, one of the plagues that came or experiences of, of um, uh, getting out of Egypt, the smiting of the Egyptians, right? And so they had to do what? They had to, uh, they had to get a what? A lamb, right? And what kind of lamb? An unblemished. Not one that had got one that was well protected, right? Unblemished, right? Is the word we, we we have in English? This lamb that was almost like perfect, right? And would have. Been, from birth would have been in a cloth to protect it because she what smart right and they just go wherever they want and they kind of eat whatever they want and they get in trouble right um, so they kept the certain lambs were were kept and what kind of clothes what do you think when you hear swaddling clothes so they would have been wrapped in a garment just like the prefigurement of the what? The incarnation, right? The Jesus, right? The word was used uh, to protect the one who was, they were no. And so they had and then they had to slaughter it, right? If they didn't have enough lamb for, for enough of the family, they would call another family. They would, they would slaughter the lamb and they would take the what? The blood and do what? They would smear it on the door, right? So that when God came into Egypt, he would pass over right, the houses of the Jewish people and just take care of the Egyptians. And that's how, you know, God would have known anyway, but, you know, I think the, the blood helped, right? And so they have this experience of a sacrificial lamb. This is a prefigurement to what Jesus gave to us at Mass, at the Last Supper. That he was unblemished lamb that gave life for what? For us, right? So if you look at the time of the Jewish people in Egypt, they were doing what? They were just vacationing along the Nile, right? They were in what? They were in slavery, right? They were in slavery, and, and God freed them from slavery to go out and to it. And they went out into the desert for 40 years, right? They thought it was a much but I think they didn't have it then, so they got lost. And they kind of wandered the desert a little bit, uh, lost. Um, and so the connection of the, what needed to happen was that from slavery, the Egyptian slavery, and they were brought into the promised land. So the connection that we have with the Christian time is we're freed from what? Sin and, and promised. In there, I think it stood and died. I think it doesn't look much better then. It doesn't, it looks, it does not look good honey. It looks like a desert. And if I were for I'm all the way for this. So green back then, uh, thousands of years ago. But 
next gen was definitely there that this understanding of Exodus, that God, Jesus becomes the new lamb of sacrifice for the new Exodus. For the new Exodus from slavery of sin, for the slavery of the Jews in Egypt to the promised land, for us the slavery of sin to new life. Okay? And so when we gather, when he gathered for the Passover meal, it was very much an understanding. They knew what happened in Egypt. They knew what happened to the Jewish people. They knew because they celebrated the year, the experience of what it meant to the Jewish people in, 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 in flight, they said. that They always had to look that they were in, in the Passover meal. You looked like you were ready to jump up at any moment to leave. And so they understood. Jesus came along and he talked about what it meant to be the unblemished lamb, the lamb of sacrifice, you must take and eat. Because it tells, tells us in the Exodus story that they had to take and eat, and they couldn't, whatever had to be, what was left over had to be then what? Burnt. Right? They couldn't leave. There was no left. Ate, eaten, or burned. And that the blood was still important, right? Because the blood was then smeared on the doorpost. It was still, and it wasn't just something they cast aside. So one of the experiences I had in, in first experience in Colombia, Father Fernando, uh, was went on New Year's Eve on the 30th, we went to the slaughterhouse and got a pig. Not a lamb, I would prefer the lamb, the pig. So we went over there and we tried one pig. That was my job. And then they brought it in a little cage of the jeep. To the farm that camp with a bunch of family members, and uh, the pig arrived and um, played with it. So the idea was they needed to get kind of that movie. That movie kind of it was just kind of a, a thing that they did, and then they then the business got it got down to business, and then. The slaughter of the pig. It's one of the worst sounds for me ever. But boy, the pig tasted good though. The pork was excellent. But everything of that animal was eaten. Everything would have been done. There was something done with every piece of that pig. Whether it be in some that they never told me what it was, which is often the case, or it was soup or some kind of a creation later on. But everything was utilized. And the same thing with the Lamb of Sacrifice. That it wasn't just about um, eating, kind of like what we do today. We eat something, we take it home, we often take leftovers home, and then we do what with the most, sadly, many times we do what? Chucking it, we don't even think about the fact that we're wasting, many of us do, or some of us do, and think wasting this food that we should have eaten or or never bought in the first place. But everything would have been would have been consumed. And so the understanding of this sacrifice at the Last Supper when Jesus talked about take and eat foreign understood that this had to be consumed. That this lamb of sacrifice. So when Jesus he now was the that was unusual. The concept was not, but that he was the lamb of sacrifice through them. And then we that he could also drink. But the, the, the importance, right? Because the sacrifice, blood symbolized what? Life. It was the life of that animal. And so it wasn't just discarded, right? The blood would have been smeared in all kinds of places and sprinkled and all kinds of things in the Old Testament sacrifices. So it wasn't just something they discarded. Just like in, in Colombia with the pig, we ate kumsia, which is uh, blood sausage, which is really good. I've never had it, but it's, it's really good. It's one of my favorite things, but nothing was wasted. Because this gave his life for another. And the same thing with the life of Jesus, that he gave his life for the other, for us. And so everything was considered sacred. 
And so when they were sitting there at the Last Supper, they were struggling with this understanding, right? But in Scripture, that unless you eat my body and drink of my blood, you shall not have life within you. And what happened in Scripture was that some people said, uh, this is really hard for us. This is really difficult for us to hear. And, you know, um, we're going to go back home. We're going to head back. Uh, we're, this is, the, the, your teaching is good. We like to hang out with you. We get free food, medical care. This is difficult. This is difficult to hear this message of consuming you, your body and blood, because, you know, even though at times human sacrifices were done, they were not done at the time of Jesus in the Jewish world. So they struggled with this. And they offered this opportunity. Jesus said, if you need to go, go. But I'm not changing my understanding of teaching, of what I'm calling you to in my life, in the life of a, a disciple of Jesus, a, my disciple, right, as Jesus talked. To accept this, many did, right? We hear in the early parts of the church, the apostles, but in the subsequent generations of, of, of early church leaders, many people came to this understanding of the goodness of the Eucharist and defended it, fought it, and throughout our history, people have died the protection of the Eucharist under attack by others to say, this is sacred. This is not something that's symbolic. This is not something that's just a, a piece of bread or some cheap wine. This is the body and blood of Christ that's broken and poured out for us. And so we have to remember this experience. Again, trying to overcome what be a habitual act. Right? We walk into church, we connect with friends, we sit in the same seat, we cover the around us, and we kind of all the with the with the, the opening song and all those, the the the, the uh, formula the formula that I'll go through, but it becomes a big thing. To kind of pull ourselves back out of that moment of, of habit to realize what the we're experiencing. And so, if we look another piece of scripture that we look at the end of Luke's gospel, which is the story of Emmaus, and many of us have heard the story of Emmaus. And do a rough, um, rough draft, so to speak, or a rough, uh, what I used to call the Reader's Digest version, but younger generations don't know what that means. Um, so a condensed version of kind of the story of Emmaus. So there's these two guys, two, excuse me, two people walking out, re leaving Jerusalem. Now there's scholars that say that this place that they were going, there's that there was no Emmaus. Some scholars say there is a place, there is a city of Emmaus, some scholars say that Jesus, there was a the man. And so they looked, they looked downtrodden. They looked beaten down. They were exhausted from the week, of Holy Week, the experience of all that Jesus went through from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. They looked downtrodden. And the stranger, seeing uh, who he really was, You're the only person that doesn't know what happened in these last few days in Jerusalem? And he goes, no, not really. What do you mean? What's going on? He began to tell him what happened, of what this experience, that, that they thought the Savior, he was going to save them from, or whom? Rome, the Roman oppression. And then they kind of get all excited. They follow this guy for X years, some of them, you know, three years or so. They got all excited. They said, this is our Savior. Yay, we're going to follow him everywhere. And then he dies. Now, the experience of the cross doesn't look so good when you're a leader. Right? I mean, if you look at it from just the perspective of your leader was killed, it's not necessarily a good sign that you should continue following this leader, right? Because he died. And yet, knowing the fuller story, right, because he rose from the dead, that the tomb was empty, 
right? And they, they heard about this, right? But they didn't experience, they heard about it, but they still were like going, what do we do next? And so Jesus says, oh, you fools, how foolish you are. And he begins to share the story of what, all that he had told them before, <laughs> Like a reminder, kind of like, like right before the test, the teacher might say, okay, let's review everything. And he reviewed everything that he talked about, connected it back to the Old Testament, and said, this, this is what this is all about. Do. And get to the fork in the road. And they said, no, please stay. He says, okay. And he sits down with bread, and in the moment of the breaking of the bread, they recognize him. And then what happens? He vanishes. And now what? They said, oh my God, it was Jesus. Our hearts were burning within us. And they get up from the table. It's dark. Like we hear in scripture, it was dark. And they went back to Jerusalem. I think they ran. Right? They were so excited. They go, let's go. And they went back and said, you will never believe what happened. And they said, you won't believe what happened. Oh, Jesus. And they recounted their story as they walked on the way. The Maya story is an encapsulation of what we do at Mass. If we look at the Mass that we celebrate today, how many of us walk in feeling the weight of the world at times? Or we feel, oh my God, I got this news today, or this week has been horrible, or whatever happened, or I just lost my relative, or I ran over my dog, or something. It's been a horrible week, a horrible month, horrible year, perhaps, for some of us. We walk into Mass going, oh, I gotta go, because it's Sunday, and something I gotta do. Or, I, or oh, I've had a horrible week, I need this. I need this. Happens in the first part of Mass. We hear the word. We hear the word. And it's broken open for us just as it was on the road to Emmaus. And then we experience in the breaking of the bread. The liturgy of the Eucharist. And then at the end of Mass, we are called to do what? Get up and go. And take what we have received and share it. Doesn't mean we have to run out. But we have to take what we have received and go. And I think if we look at it just as as that, the story of Emmaus, it kind of, again, a version of what we're experiencing at Mass. We come forward renewed and, and fed and, and kind of strengthened in many ways. We hear the scripture. It means that scripture means to us and our call by God. We experience the breaking of the bread and recognize him in the breaking of the bread. And then we're to go forth and live that. We're called to go forth and live that out in our lives. But I wonder how many of us actually think about it in that way. Many of us look at Mass as an obligation. I have to go to Mass on Sunday because that's what I've always done in my life, and I have to go to Mass because if I don't go to Mass, I'm going to hell. Right? And, or we see it as, well, I just have to do this one Sunday before we go for donuts. Or Repley, or whatever breakfast place there is. And it's part of our routine. And I think it goes back to what I said in the beginning, that this rote action, this habitual act, and, real, and not realize the giftedness, not just in the gift of the Eucharist, the experience of coming to the one, and being together as the body of Christ, two, hearing the scripture, the presence of God and his broken open in four readings. You know, one of the critiques of Catholics is we don't read the Bible, right? 
and yet at Mass, there's four pieces of scripture that are proclaimed on Sunday, let alone the scripture that exists within the songs that we sing. And then we can have to come together and say, this is my body. This is my blood. Broken and poured out for you. To release us from the bond of slavery, of sin, to this abiding love and mercy, to ex one day experience eternal life. That's what it's about. And then hopefully we're, we're just overjoyed and go, let me tell you what happened to me today. Let me tell you what I experienced at Mass. The difficulty that we have, I think, sometimes we go, oh, we go, we go with our friends or we go out and we go, oh, can you believe that song that they sung? Or, oh, that homily went forever. We didn't shut up so we can get on to get the next part. Instead of, what did we just experience, experience in the past? It was a very interesting story that was, um, um, I had on a retreat, and it's about a, a guy who went to Mass, and he um, wanted, if I, did, if I shared this story before, let me know. It's about a guy who became Catholic. Did I share that story already? So he was a young man who was a son of a Baptist deacon, and so one day he had the gumption to go to his parents and say, I want to become Catholic. Oh, my God. No. And they try to figure out how to fix him of this problem, right? And so they did everything. Finally, his parents gave in, and they went on Saturday night to Mass at the local church. And they got there about an hour before and sat in the back pew. And he begins to describe everything that he witnessed on a Saturday night Mass. He talked about the guy who went in the broom closet, were coming out, and then other people went to other broom that and kept coming out and there was a light that went on and off and and then you know the, pre the priest came with a tablecloth around his neck and walked down the aisle and there was you know music because the eight years old and the, the, the sermon was very short they were just kind of getting into the sermon and then they realized them there was liquor. Because they were right in front of the credence table. So there was wine. And they go, oh my God. Liquor at church. And they stop. And the whole time, this guy, this young kid is talking with his mom. So it's his mom and dad and this, and this kid. And he finally, they finally come with mass and the young kid turns to his mother and his mother says I hope this has cured you of your desire to become Catholic and he says absolutely I don't want to be Catholic no way, no how, I'm done and the wife learn, turns to the husband and says see this work we finally got him cured and the husband turns to them and says I've been looking for Jesus my whole life, and I finally saw him tonight. He became Catholic, the wife became Catholic, the son became Catholic, better become a monk and a priest. The power that exists within, within the experience of Mass, if we allow that presence to be there, not getting caught up in or getting caught up in the habitual they like giftedness even at times when it doesn't work perfectly or it's not done what you think it should be done too long or whatever it is that we realize there's a beauty in the experience of what God is providing us if we don't aren't open so if we're not open to that experience it can pass us by because in the story of the young man with his two parents the father didn't say a word. It was the mother and the son that were talking back and forth the whole time. It was the father who was silent, experiencing the presence of God in the Eucharist, and his word broke for us. 
but sometimes we can get caught in the distractful experience and walk in with the understanding of what's happening here. What's the moment and opportunity to have with my risen Lord in word and in sacrament? It can be extremely powerful. But if it's just a habitual act that we fulfill because we have to do it, we can miss out on being made manifest in our midst. And I know, there are times when you go, oh. I mean, I, I, when I go on vacation, I typically don't celebrate Mass. Um, it might sound weird, but I typically go to a, a parish and sit in the back. Uh, the problem I have is I'm a critic. And so, why is he doing that? What's she doing over here? Sit down, be quiet, finish up, wrap it up, land the plane. You know? But even if there's still a beauty that we can miss, witness that, or be open to what God is trying to reveal to us. So that's a very broad overview of what we experienced at Mass. So the, there's four parts, right? So we have introductory, so the song, uh, the unit of Mass, the, our name of the, you know, we begin in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have the experience of the natural rite, uh, and we have the Gloria and the opening prayer. That consists of the introductory rite. Then going to the Liturgy of the Word, which is the second major part. Um, and then we have which is, you know, the Old Testament, usually Testament reading Psalm and the Gospel. And then the homily is wrapped into the, the word along with the creed and the prayers of the faithful. Okay? And then we proceed to the preparation of the gift, bread and wine, and then begin with the Eucharistic prayer, the blessing, of which two epiclesis or two calling down upon the, of the Holy Spirit upon the gifts of bread and wine. And reception of the Eucharist, our Father, excuse me, our Father, um, the reception of the Eucharist, and then the experience of uh, going forth, being sent forth. Um, and then the fourth part is the final prayer, the final prayer, the blessing, the announcements, the appeals, the uh, this and that parts, Mass, and then we're sent forth. So four parts, two major components we'll talk about next time, right? So the, the first part of the Liturgy of the, Euchar Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. Those two major components we'll talk about in October and then again in January. Alright, so I'm going to allow questions if you want to write down questions. You don't have a question. Okay. Or something. What are you doing? <laughs> so we're going to do that. So I've never done that before. So I had never experienced, I didn't know how that was going to go. Um, so we're going to do that quarterly, four times a year. Uh, we're going to do that because I, I don't, it, again, if we did it every week, it would just become this ritual act that we do and it wouldn't probably mean as much. So we're going to do it, we have it scheduled for the next four quarters, I think is what it is, Dan, every three months. Uh, just to sit down, I, I heard the same thing from other people that um, it was very powerful and moving. Um, I did, so the diocese had it called for, because of the year the renewal of the Eucharist, that they called for processions. I didn't know how a procession would go in the parking lot. Because 10% or 20% of the people are going to be in their cars racing to get out of here. And we're trying to process with the Eucharist with a car beeping at us in the back or something like that. Or a kid wandering off. And so I, I didn't really think the procession would work. So I came up with the idea of having a simple act of adoration. So thank you. I didn't have any, com amazingly here, I didn't have any complaints uh, about that. So it was all compliments of powerful, it, me, uh, thank you so much. When are we doing this again? So we have Yes. Okay. <clears throat> 
Think, so just go ahead. Think back three years ago. When we couldn't go to Mass during the pandemic. The problem is, statistics show people got very used to staying at home. You know, when the churches were closed for that period of time, it sounded like it was a year. We weren't closed for a year. But we gave permission for people to go online. And people went, God didn't strike me down. I haven't, you know, I haven't, been, you know, in ailments. And so this is pretty cool. I can have my, I can sit in and watch Mass uh, in my pajamas, drink my coffee, have a little Wonder Bread or whatever, or toast, and I'm good to go. We've got, and it's not just a Catholic thing. There are whole Protestant churches who went totally online. They sold their property and now they're just online. Because they realize that a lot of people are, are, very, are very accustomed to just going online and watching, experiencing something, and the communal aspect has fallen away. And it's a sad part for me. I mean, there's people that don't go to Mass every Sunday and are, now, the attendance online is nowhere near what it was during the pandemic. There were thousands of people online. I assume there were statistics, statistics where they were watching. I don't know what they were doing. You know, the, their screen was open, the camera was, you know, looking at the, the screen at Mass, but what was happening at home may not have been the whole Mass. Because I know people said, Father, I stayed for the homily, and then I shut down the screen after that. Again, we get into habits, good and bad, um, that led us to this point where a good chunk of people aren't here every Sunday because it just wasn't, it's not important anymore. So. Oh, we're not stopping Mass. No, no. We're gonna keep. <laughs> Don't stop the live stream. No, I mean, we invested, since I got here, we, it was, it's much better. I used to have one old camera, I think from the one I was here the first time. Um, panning back and forth, and we finally put we put some more cameras in, so at least there's some a semblance of more connectedness online for people who just can't. And I understand there's people who can't, uh, but there's a lot of people who don't. Yes. Yes. During the mass. Where can you find in scripture of giving thanks? Let me look at that. Actually, Quentin's going to look at that because he's an academic. There he goes. He's writing it down for me. All right. Still not. Still not. It's still
and I agree with you. The problem is we need to be open to that. And I think, again, when we start just doing something not cognizant or aware or open, then we get in, but we're like, well, not now, not today, no thank you. We may not be saying that uh, consciously, but by our, our desire to, to say, I'm not really open to this, we're, we're resisting what, the, what God is trying to do in our lives. Ron? They say the golden age of liturgy was in the 300s. Uh, so when the church, you got to remember the history of the church. So Jesus, zero approximately. They say that it's about six years off. But zero birth ministry, 30 to 33. Um, the beginnings of the church, the formulation of a, of a, of a non-restricted church was in the 300s. Um, but the, the mass would be in celebrated for that period of time from 30, again, 33 to 313, some other 315, when Constantine said the religion can be now officially uh, celebrated and recognized within the Roman Empire. Um, liturgy was still going on. So the celebration of sitting around table and breaking bread, the sharing of the cup, that was being done from the beginning, typically in houses, uh, from the beginning. It was being Christians at a time in fear of, um, and they were risking their lives to be able to celebrate. And so, once it was recognized that they were able to come out of the celebrate the liturgy um, in public. celebration of the break of bread usually was the term that they would often share with them. Eucharist was a word used from the very beginning. Eucharist meaning Thanksgiving. So. so that's one of the things in history of the church that right now there's a big debate, those who follow debates within the church, um, with what's called the TLM, the traditional Latin Mass. Uh, and what's known as what's called celebrate in what's called the Novus Ordo, the new since 1965. Um, but there is a tradition of having a traditional Latin Mass also. So there's this big debate. Francis has kind of put the kibosh on that and said, no, we're gonna we need to be celebrating the Novus Ordo, and a, a rare occasions or permissions can be granted for the TLM because stuff TLM, the true way to celebrate Mass. That the mass has always been celebrated like that, and da 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 da. It's not the complete history of the church. Uh, what would be considered for those of you who are pre-Vatican II, I am not. I don't ever experience what it looked like pre-Vatican II, seen it on movies. But um, for those people who want, that was not always the way mass was celebrated. But we. Was or is, I think is, is, is still trying to do that golden of going back to what we rootedly celebrated as Mass um, in the history of the church. Does it make sense? Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, Quentin. You have an answer for me already? It better not be something Google ish, you know, you got to be authentic. Teaching, it can't be something that's. That's what I pay you for. the question
So for thanks, but he just go, hey, thanks, Dad. Uh, but were there more words? What were there specific words of thanksgiving that he spoke? I think that's their question. Is that is that your question? But that's your question, right? What were not just he gave thanks? Were there words specific words of thanks? Okay, so get on that. say that uh, inaudibly it's called during the mass when we have music and otherwise like during daily mass if we don't if someone's not singing then those words are spoken out loud um, but I think it's it's it, it sounds very reductionary in the math to say he gave thanks but we'll, we'll, let me do some research Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. My mother taught me sometimes that's the, that's the easiest thing to say. Just say thank you. <laughs> um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing just to say thank you. Uh, you don't have to necessarily go into a diatribe of prayer. But Quinn's on it. He's, he's looking at it now. I don't know if he'll find it. But are there, were there other, was there a specific prayer that he would have said in giving thanks? Right. In between what? And once he consecrates the bread, and, and then uh, does the same thing after the wine. So in Spanish, at least in my experience with the Spanish community, after the elevation of the host and the elevation of the cup, there's, uh, oh my Lord, uh, or my Lord and my God, um, is sometimes said by people inaudibly and many times audibly, um, but that's not necessarily part of the liturgy. Um, but it, it, well, it's usually my Lord and my God. So that's biblical. I can't remember biblically what that is, but the, the people said when they saw Jesus, my Lord and my God. Yes. right so there's a beauty in ritual I went you know when you travel in the world and you go to Italy or Spain or Portugal or South America or whatever and you go to Catholic Mass you go I know what I'm doing I don't have any idea what they're saying but I kind of know where we're at you know kind of walk into the ritual experience and that's which is beautiful I think as a Catholic that I can go to the world and go 
I'm still experiencing mass even in a language that I don't quite understand. On the other side, there's a the did that, right? Is that it becomes, we say the same prayers, the ritual is exactly the same, the words of institution are the same, the words of Eucharistic prayers, we have choices of those of about 10 or 12. Uh, I try to mix them up a little bit, not use the same uh, Eucharistic prayers. Um, some people are dry, some people are and going, which one are you doing? I don't know which one you're doing. Um, and okay. um, um, so there's, a, there's this idea, right? Having this experience of the, the liturgy that's kind of the same. People share with me with, with the experience of losing someone at a funeral that they kind of, you know, you're still in shock many times and you're just, you have the ritual kind of ground. It's the same thing. Um, and so how do we, can I, can I change the liturgy? No. Um, I don't, I'm not a singer. I know some priests sing the Mass. Um, you would not want that. Uh, because I don't sing the Mass. I don't sing. Um, solo, especially. I can sing with a group of people. But sing. It would be like nails. Um, so. Uh, I'm singing the Exalted. Yeah, sure. Uh, we're skipping the exalted next year then. Um, so I, it's one of the things that how do you hyphen it up, my words, uh, and make it or um, because For me, it can be the same thing that I do. Out there, um, one of the parishioners, the last assignment, I used to go and walk around before Mass and say hello. And so one day she said to another parishioner, she goes, I don't I think he should just come out right when Mass starts and go back in. I, so there was one Sunday, she, I was walking around and I, I asked the woman, okay. So then a few weeks after that, the woman, one in the pink shirt, comes up to me and goes, Father, Father, Father. Because I'm around before Mass. She goes, I want to introduce you to my son. I said, oh, so it's okay when I walk around before Mass when your son's here. Um, but not okay any other time. I didn't, I didn't say that to her. Um, I thought about it. And I, when she said, I, when she told the person, I want you just to come out, I thought it was like a cuckoo clock. You know, the cuckoo comes out of the clock and does this thing and it goes right back in. Um, and, I, and if you look at pre what I understood was pre-Vatican II, the priest came out of the, the sacristy, did his thing, and then went kind of like, like a, went back in. Um, I, I hope that we don't get into that ritual. I think some priests sadly do. Um, others, I mean, uh, there's other people who prefer that I just come out like a cuckoo clock and just come in and go out. But... Feel the need to cry at mass? Yeah, but like, it's like Tears of joy or sadness? Something happened, right? <laughs> Enjoy it. Let it not become a habitual act that you just simply do. Because there, there's moments, 
in the Mass, if we're open, it may be a song. Maybe not one word of Scripture. It might be a song that we hear. That, oh my God, that song changed me. Or I never heard the Scripture. That Scripture every three years for the last 40 years of my life. But I never heard it proclaimed that way. Well, maybe uh, everybody is, are we prepared to come to Mass? Do we prepare ourselves before we get there? Do we actually read the Scripture before we walk in the room? Um, there's opportunity for us to do that and not just in the pew before Mass on Sunday. We can actually, on the way to church, you can push a button and it'll play it for you on your app. You know, you can hear the readings proclaimed to you. You don't have to read um, So there's opportunities for us to get ready for what we're seeing rather than just going, okay, touch. It's at Mass one Sunday that he goes, I don't get anything out of Mass. And I said, what are you bringing? He goes, I don't come here to bring anything. I just come here to get. I said, that's your problem. And he walked away sad. And he came back to me years later and said, thank you. Because he realized that what I was saying wasn't all crazy. That we have to at least bring our openness of ourselves. Let alone the opportunity to say, Lord, I'm bringing myself, I'm open, I'm ready to, to, to experience what you're offering to me, and I'm also going to sing, I'm going to participate, I'm going to read the scriptures before Mass, I'm going to be fully active and participatory in the experience of what we celebrate. Anything else? Yes. Question. words of institution? because we don't have kneelers um, special permission was given for us just to simply kneel what's called the words of institution not for the consecration not for the second kneeling so what so let me talk a little bit about so a little bit about posture so in the what's called the germ the instruction of the Roman Missal um, which is in the first part of the Eucharistic, or the Mystery, Great Mass. So it's, you do this, you do this, um, um, and it kind of gives, a, 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 it's my instruction, but, okay? And in the f section of posture, it says, you do, whatever you do at post in posture, you do it together. Okay? So I use this, at mass, daily mass, one one during the week. If I were to go to someone's house, I used I think I used the experience of going to an Asian home. That typically my experience of going to people's uh, home who are from Asia is I take off my shoes. And so I may not want to take off my shoes because I have to. I always I always have to make sure that I have socks that aren't holy. No, that are blessed but not holy, right? So. I have to make sure of that. It's a cognizant thought. I got to make sure I don't have holes in my socks because I'm going to have to take off my shoes. I may not want to take off my shoes, uh, but I do because that's their custom. Right? Uh, and so when I've been to Mass at other places in the world, I follow the custom of the house. And that's hard for some people because do things a little bit differently. It's not that it's wrong. It's just different. And so we have permission. Some people, one person said to me one Sunday, they were visiting, they go, I'm not sure that was a Catholic Mass. I'm like, yes, it was. It was a Catholic Mass. I'm an ordained priest. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, 
because it wasn't what they were expecting. So, but I've also mass in Haiti that three hours and we didn't kneel at all. A lot of singing. And so I their their custom of their house. I'm not going to sit there and kneel. Everyone else is standing because that if I were to do if I were to do that again, simple comparison. If I were to walk in with someone's house that says, "Please take off your shoes," and I say, "I'm not taking off my shoes. I'm wearing my shoes," that can be seen as a, an affront to their customs. The way they, and I don't think that's. Fair. Um, so posture has all the, the posture term is whatever is you do that together in unity. And so uh, I haven't addressed that at Sunday Mass. There are some people who are kneeling when they normally would kneel at well, kneelers, but we are kneel and or that is that we kneel for the words of institution. Does that answer your question? Yes, it's not a sacrilege. You're not going to hell. Right. So with the time when we're supposed to, we're called to kneel. Years ago, when kneelers were not placed in this parish, um, and the, the understanding was, since we didn't have kneelers, we would simply. But if I can't kneel. I don't think God's going. You know, be this thing in order to be. You know, some people sit, and it's okay. Yes. When is it acceptable to say mass for you? Never. <laughs> so celebrating mass outside of a church. So like, I mean, that's as far as I've been a priest. You can celebrate mass. I mean, I celebrated Mass at, at campgrounds, and we have Mass at the lake every year at the Lake Alatuna. But it's not a normative experience. So, one is in Georgia, it's too darn hot to be outside all the time. I mean, when I got done with the Mass at the lake, I was like, oh my God, it's hot out. And, you know, people complain about the temperature in their church. They got to remember, I'm wearing four layers of plastic. Um, and it's like, it's, I'm well insulated. And so, is it is it is it possible to do so? But it's not the norm. Like if if I were to go to if the bishop were to find out I'm celebrating mass at like every week, he'd be like, "What are you doing that for?" So, when you have a perfectly good church to celebrate in, I want to be. No other questions. Terry, or your questions are never quick. We're all we're all fixed. No. So. So yes. When I mass, we have a mass with a sacrament for the sick. So that's, it's not quite the same terminology. So we have a mass where we celebrate the sacrament of the sick at mass. That's correct. So we, we can get caught up into the experience of a healing mass, meaning like, kind of like what we see on TV with Benny and, you know, you're, 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 you get pushed down, you got people catching people on, fall down, down. Um, mass with the sacrament of the sick. So, in my last assignment, I was at Prince of Peace, we celebrated Mass. Uh, so it was Mass, we celebrated the sacrament. Uh, I'm told 
But anyone's welcome to re Yes. So mass, so normally for weddings. So, so there are situations with marriage, which we wouldn't celebrate a funeral outside of mass. Although I've celebrated, I've had people that said, Father, we cannot afford to come to the church because funeral homes charge. So we can't afford to the church. Can you celebrate mass at the funeral home? I've done that. Um, Weddings, the normative location for a wedding with Catholics or two Christian people is the church. Not outside on the beach. There have been special permissions granted to people when there's a Catholic and a non-baptized person. Because it's not a sacrament. So when a Catholic and a non-Christian get married... That's not a sacrament. So there's been special permission granted to them to be able to celebrate at a non-church location. But again, that's not the norm. Um, yeah. Anything else? The Lord be with you. Amen. Heavenly Father, we get, seek your counsel Guide us along the path you have chosen for us. May we open to experience your abiding love in the breaking open of the bread, of the word, and the sacrament of body and blood of Christ broken and poured out for us. May we never see it as a symbol or an action taken lightly, but your abiding presence being made manifest in our lives. We ask these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you.